Well, God bless you. We've reached the ending last five chapters of the book of Genesis. God still cares. We've seen him take care of his people all the way through. And we're going to be dealing now with the, the, the last segment. Uh, and, it, and we're dealing with Joseph, part four. So God cares, part 14, Joseph, part four. And when, his son, when uh, Jacob's sons returned from Egypt, they told their dad, Joseph is most certainly alive. After 21 years of thinking he was dead. Now the seven years of extreme famine is in the year two. Israel is on its way to Egypt for food and protection. They will settle in the land of Goshen, which is the Nile Delta area. And it's in the best of the land near where Joseph lives. While there, his descendants could grow in peace into a great nation as God had promised Abraham. Then they would be ready to take possession of the promised land. So we start in Genesis 46, verse 1. And Israel took his journey with all that he had. He came to Beersheba. When he got to Beersheba, he offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. Now Beersheba is on the direct route to Egypt. It had been a favorite encampment of Abraham and Isaac. It was memorable for their experience of divine goodness. So Jacob had waited until reaching a spot so consecrated by covenant to his own God and the God of his fathers before making sacrifices to God and expecting guidance from him. Now the figure of speech, Epizusius, it's duplication. Jacob, Jacob is utilized by God to remind him of what he, what he was and had been in contrast to what God would make him. So that's the first one is what he was, what he had been, and now what God had made him into today, you know, into that time frame. And this figure was used by God concerning Abraham at a rather pivotal point in his life also. Genesis twenty two eleven, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thy anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Once God had the patriarch Jacob's attention, he could reveal more of his overall plan to him. And in verse 3, he said, God said, I am God. I am the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. And that was a I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again, and Joseph shall put his hand upon thy eyes. This was a much needed and reassuring vision from God, guaranteeing Jacob that this was part of God's master plan. They needed to go into Egypt for the peace and safety it would provide for them to grow into a great nation. There is no reason to fear since God would be going with them. And for that matter, we don't, we don't need to fear anything also because that same God is with us at all times. To put his hand on one's eyes in Aramaic idiom, meaning he shall close your eyes when you die and bury you. So God's telling him that when Jacob dies, Joseph will be the one who will make the preparations for his burial wishes in the land of Canaan and bury him with Isaac and Abraham. Verse 5. And Jacob rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, and their little ones, and their wives, in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And they took their cattle and their goods which they had gotten in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, Jacob, and all his seed with him, his sons, and his sons' sons with him, his daughters, and his sons' daughters, and all his seed brought he with him into Egypt. And these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. Then God lists all the descendants of Jacob that go into Egypt. I want to point a few of them out, like verse 11, and the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Um, Levite's descendants through these three sons 
will later be assigned to protect and transport the tabernacle in the wilderness. Jochebed is to be added, for she came into Egypt in her mother. <laughs> so uh, Numbers 26.59, and the name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, whom her mother bare to Levi in Egypt. And she bare unto Amram, Aaron, Moses, and Marion, their sister. And this is helping you to understand that they weren't in captivity for 400 years in Egypt. You know, when you start seeing the lineage, they're, they're fairly quick. So the 215 years is all it was. We'll see that uh, over the next few weeks. All right, now Genesis 46, 12, we go to the sons of Judah. Remember Ur and Onan? You don't need to remember them very long. They died. And Shela and Fariz and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Fariz were Hezron and Hamul. The Christ line went through Judah, Fariz, Hezron, which is spelled as Ezram in Matthew's gene genealogy. So understanding who the Christ line went through above the 12 sons and then which children. So that's what that is. All right, verse 26. All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's sons' wives, all the souls were threescore and six. And the sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were threescore and ten. Okay, so there were 66 that came out of his loins and into Egypt. When Joseph and his family is counted, there's the four more that's where we get to 70. But, you know, since they were already in Egypt, they didn't come in with them. But in Acts 7, 14, the martyr Stephen says it's 75. So where did they, who were these other five? The other five, uh, actually, two belong, I think it's two to Ephraim and three to Manasseh or the other way around. But the, the five extra that were brought up are listed in 1 Chronicles 7, 14 to 20. So you get the full 75 of them. Verse 28, and he sent Judah before him unto, jo unto Joseph to direct his face into Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. And Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen, and presented himself unto him. Here it is, after 21 years, after thinking he was dead, face to face. And he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. I bet he did. And Israel said unto Joseph, now let me die since I have seen thy face, because you really are yet alive. This doesn't mean that Jacob was ready to die, but he no longer had a load of grief. He could now die in peace. He's going to live 17 more years there. Verse 31. And Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds, for their trade hath been to feed cattle. And they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and shall say, What is your occupation? That ye shall say, Thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth, even until now, both we and also our fathers, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Yeah, I said 31 years, but it's only 17, rather. Jo uh, Jacob's going to live 17 more years in, in Egypt. Joseph's advice would commend his brethren to Pharaoh, first off, uh, in 47.6, you see that. And then he would keep them separate from the Egyptians. The Egyptians were an agricultural people, thus the lush pasture lands in the land of Goshen, which belonged to the crown, were unused. They looked down on the nomad people whose occupation was raising livestock, sheep, and cattle. The city people usually were engaged in arts, crafts, farming, and manufacture of household articles, which they exchanged for butter, wool, cheese, and other products. Genesis 47, verse 1 now. Then Joseph came and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brother and their flocks and their herds and all that they have are come out of the land of Canaan, and behold, they now are in the land of Goshen. And he took some of his brother, and he took five of them, and he presented them to Pharaoh. Here, here's five of my brothers. You didn't see them last time they were here. <laughs> um, so he presented them unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh looked at them and said, hey, what's your occupation? And they said unto Pharaoh, thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. 
They said, moreover unto Pharaoh, for to sojourn in the land are we come, for thy servants have no pasture for their flocks. For the famine was sore in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph and said, thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee, and the best of the land. Make thy father uh, and brethren to dwell in the land of Goshen. Let them dwell. And if they know any capable or qualified men of activity, and if, you know, if they're really good at shepherding you know, among them, then make them officials. Make them rulers over my cattle. Have them take care of my herds. And it'll be, they'll be official. They'll be officially given that responsibility. And Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and set him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, man, how old are you? Or how many are the days? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. Jacob calls his life a sojourning. That is, he lived as a resident alien for 130 years, just constantly moving around. His life had been full of disagreement and unfavorable circumstances, but not evil in the moral sense. It's just he had faced a lot of obstacles. Verse 10. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. And Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their families. Joseph fed and took care of, took care of his father and brothers and their families throughout the whole time frame of the famine. Verse 13. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. And Joseph said, Give your cattle, and I will give you for your cattle if money fail. Right. They're all running out of silver. So Joseph then took their livestock and trade, which was a good thing because he was able to keep them alive during the years of famine. If there isn't any food to feed your family, you're not going to feed your animals. So Joseph took all the livestock so he could keep them alive. Verse 17. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph. And Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for the flocks and for the cattle of the herds, and for the asses. And he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. And when that year was ended, they came unto him the second year, and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. My Lord also hath our herds of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our lands. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes? both we and our land, buy us and our land for bread. And we and our land will be thy servants unto Pharaoh and give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. Because the famine was so severe, Egypt was not producing any food. The people were full of anxiety and ran out of silver trying to feed themselves and their families. Joseph then set up a barter system where they traded livestock for food. When that ran out, they sold their land, you know, their farm properties, and themselves as servants. The only land he did not buy belonged to the priests. Verse 20, and Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field because the famine prevailed over them. So the land became Pharaoh's. One, one of the ways to control people, the biggest way is with if there is no food in the land. People are willing to do many different things, right, uh, without food or fear of disease or something like that. So the famine prevailed over them. Uh, and as long as they can, you feed the people, they won't rebel. But you better have something for them. And Joseph did. So all the land became Pharaoh's. 
And as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other end thereof. Only the land of the priests bought he not. For the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh and did eat their portion, which Pharaoh gave them. Wherefore, they sold not their lands. Now, during his earlier trip through Egypt, remember Joseph identified potential problem makers from among the people. Thus, he moved the leaders and some of their followers to different areas apart from each other, thus ending potential trouble before it started. This is before times of cell phones and we could talk to each other. They didn't know where these people were going, so they, he moved them all around so they couldn't um, gather themselves together to cause problems. Verse 23, then Joseph said unto the people, behold, I have bought you this day and your land for myself. No, for Pharaoh. He's, he's, glorif he's doing all of this on behalf of Pharaoh. Lo, now here's some seed for you and you shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the increase that you shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh. And four parts shall be your own for seed of the field, for your food, for them of your households, and for food for your little ones. And they said, thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law of the land of Egypt until this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth part, except the land of the priests only, which became not Pharaoh's. When the Egyptians found that all their substance was gone and there was no hope of borrowing money or wheat, they became servants to Pharaoh. Joseph gave them seed and commanded them that from any crops they could produce, they would pay Pharaoh the fifth part of their increase. Meanwhile, Israel's family is very prosperous and just keeps increasing in numbers. Verse 27. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen. And they had possessions therein and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the whole age of Jacob was 140 and seven years. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, if now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt, but I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt, and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast, that held, as thou hast said. And he said, Swear unto me. And he swore unto him. And Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. Joseph is charged by Jacob to bury him in the cave of Machpelah, where his ancestors are buried. So now we move into chapter 48, and Bob will continue reading. And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee. And I will make of thee a multitude of people and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. The reason Jacob is referring to this remarkable vision at, at Luz, it's actually Bethel. It's the same city as Bethel. They just called it Luz uh, at times. Was to draw attention to the glorious promises reserved for his descendants and to engage Joseph's interests to help him maintain his continued connection with the people of God rather than with the Egyptians. Later, Moses will have to make a similar decision. Should I be a Hebrew or should I be an Egyptian? Verse 5, and now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine. They're mine, just like Reuben and Simeon. They shall be mine. Jacob accepts both of Joseph's sons as being on the same level as his sons, just like Reuben, just like Simeon are. That is the reason they are listed among the tribes of Israel. By giving Eph, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh a full portion of the inheritance, Joseph was guaranteed the birthright. First Chronicles 5, we've read this before, uh, verse 1 and 2. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, 
His birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. For, jo for Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph's. So that ensured that Joseph had the birthright. Now the sons of Joseph could have rejected Jacob's offer. Right? And through their connections, they might have attached themselves to Egypt to take full advantage of their potential lucrative prospects in the land of their nativity. They'd grown up there. They had great connections there in Egypt. They could very easily just write their own ticket. However, they willingly accepted this adoption by Jacob and were treated as if they were direct descendants of, of Joseph, I mean, of, uh, of uh, Jacob, even though they were sons of Joseph. Chapter 48, verse 6. And thy issue, which thou begetst after them, shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. And as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan, in the way, when yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath. I buried her there in the way of Ephrath, the same is Bethlehem. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, These are my sons, whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them, and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God hath showed me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. The laying on of hands has different meanings. Here it was to transmit God's blessings from one person to another. The physical contact identifies the person who's receiving the blessing. The hand symbolizes power and authority. In verse 15, and he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did habitually walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. And let them grow. It's a word that means swarm like fishes. Uh, they're going to describe the children of Israel in Exodus the same way, right? They're like swarming everywhere. Let them these two let them grow and multiply in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. For he and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Oh, not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. But thy right hand, you know, put thy right hand upon his head. Joseph thought his father, being nearly blind, had made a mistake with the placement of his hands. But, you know, but there are many instances in the Bible where God chose a younger son Gideon, David, Solomon. Trust in God, along with sincere love for him, means much more than mere natural inheritance. Verse 19. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Now, what he's talking about is this area was near Shechem. 
The Amorites had probably seized it during his many absences, but the united force of his tribe and the willingness of God recovered it. The record is not included in the Bible, but here's a reference to it. Uh, and here, look at John 4, 5, and 6. Then comes he, this is Jesus, to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the, the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. This is what we're talking about. And here it is, Jesus Christ, and everybody was aware of it because Jacob's well was there. And Jacob's well still there today. In fact, they're, still, they're fighting over it last week. Uh, so, But it was a parcel of ground Jacob gave to Joseph, and that's what he's talking about. But he had to fight for it and get it back because the Amorites had seized him. All right, we go to chapter 49 now, verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, the excellency of power. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, have preeminence, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defiledst thou it. He went up to my couch. Now he says he's unstable as water, and that's an Aramaic saying that he was undecided or undependable. He lacked integrity and moral character. You know, when water's poured out, it runs everywhere. You know, and that's what they're referring to. It's unstable as water, going at you just going everywhere. No judge, prophet, or ruler sprang from this tribe. Verse five. Now Simeon and Levi, their brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations, or uh, instruments of cruelty are their weapons of violence. Their weapons of violence are their swords. O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret council. You know, don't hang out with those guys and, and you know, in quiet or under their assembly. My honor, be not thou united, for in their anger they killed men. And in their self-willed, they made they decided they didn't do it by accident. They self-willed, they dig down a well, or basically that's a terrible translation. They hamstrung oxen, which means they knowingly cut their leg tendons. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Since Simeon and Levi were associate, associates in wickedness. The same revelation would be applicable to both. When Joshua divided the land, Simeon was scattered throughout the remaining tribes. Joshua 19.1. And the second lot came forth to Simeon, even for the tribe of the children of Simeon, according to their families. And their inheritance was within the inheritance of the children of Judah. Not the tribe of Judah, but within the children of Judah. So they were scattered throughout the whole area of Judah. And the tribe of Levi belonged to God because of their zeal against idolatry at the golden calf incident. They had cities allotted to them throughout every tribe. You see that in Joshua 21. Genesis 49, 8. Now it gets to Judah. So after Simeon and Levi, and that wasn't real good, you know, for, you know, Jacob is foretelling what's going to happen with their tribes, with their children, as they grow stronger, as they, you know, as they grow and multiply and then go into the promised land. Uh, don't really want that one uh, as my inheritance. Now, here's Judas, 49.8. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thy enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp or a lion's cub. You know, he has a little power. From, from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. And as an old lion, no lion is calm and quiet, still formidable though. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Let me read you Lambs' translation of verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until the coming of the one, who is the Messiah, to whom the scepter belongs, to whom the Gentiles shall look forward. Israel's leadership and preeminence is destined by this tribe. 
Not only would a descendant of Judah reign as king, David, over the tribes of Israel, but the royal scepter, the Messiah, would come through this tribe of Judah. Kings and lawgivers were to come forth out of Judah's descendants until the coming of the Messiah, who was to establish a universal kingdom and become a light to the Gentiles, become a light to the entire world. Now, the word Shiloh is not understood, and really some texts just omit it altogether. The scepter is the symbol of authority or leadership. The tribe of Judah was to be the most important of the 12 tribes. Verse 11, talking more about Judah. Binding his fowl uh, unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine. That's yaying. That's the intoxicating kind. And his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine. His eyes shall be darker than wine. And his teeth whiter than milk. These are colloquial expressions figuratively used to say that he will inhabit a lamb graced with many vineyards and that he will have plenty of wine to drink. Well, wine was drunk because of a lack of water. He shall also have an abundance of flocks and plenty of milk, signifying that the people would have plenty of sheep products, so their teeth were white and in good condition. Verse 13. Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea, and he shall be for a haven of ships, and his border shall be into Zidon, or Zidon. Zebulun was to live on the shore of a sea, it's the Mediterranean, and to engage in maritime pursuits and commerce. 14, Ishtachar is a strong ass. Well, it basically means he's a saddle bearer. He's a real strong ass, this guy. Now, he's a saddle bearer, crouching between the two burdens. So the saddle is between burdens on each side. And he saw that rest was good and the land that it was pleasant and bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant on the tribute, he became a servant of forced labor. Okay, when the tribe of Ishkachar realized that rest was good, the land was pleasant, they preferred to pay tribute to the Canaanites rather than engage in the struggle to expel them. So they just became slaves to them. Land was good, it was pleasant. Hey, we all got it easy. We'll just be, you know, we'll just give them, you know, tribute and we'll all live happily ever after, so to speak. All right. Verses 16 and 17, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes, as one of the scepters or rulers of Israel. So some of the judges came out of Dan. But Dan shall be a serpent. He shall be seducing to idolatry, by the way. He's going to be an adder in the path. He's going to be a horned snake on the road that bites the horse heels so that his rider shall fall backward. See, Dan is the first tribe to let idolatry rule it. Remember Judges 8, we got, you know, Micah's house of gods, the whole tribe of Dan went after false gods. Thus, it is omitted in Revelation 7, where it lists the, the rewards of the different tribes. Dan's just totally omitted. It won't be rewarded. Now, verse 18 is great. He just takes a break and says, you know, I've waited for the salvation, O Lord. Jacob stops his prophetic blessings to proclaim that he is waiting with expectation for the Lord's salvation. The tribe should not depend on their own strength or abilities, but for real salvation, deliverance, and fulfillment of promises, which only God could provide. Verse 19. What about Gad, Bob? Gad, a troop, raiders, shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. Gad was often attacked and wasted by hostile powers on their border. So Judges 10.8 talks about the Jeremiah 49.1. But they became generally victorious in their later skirmishes. Verse 20, what about Asher? Asher, his bread shall be fat, rich, and he shall yield royal dainties, delicacies. Asher is blessed. Its, it's allotment was the seacoast between Tyre and Carmel, a district fertile for the production of the finest wheat and oil in all Palestine. Naphtali, though, he's a hind or a doe. He's like a doe let loose. He gives goodly words. Okay, so he, he's giving one beautiful sayings, but that's how it's translated. But most of the other translators have it as he yields lovely fawns. Basically, Naphtali is a deer roaming at liberty that bears beautiful fawns. His inheritance would be in a land that was fertile and peaceable, 
feeding on the richest pasture. He would spread out like a deer with breaching antlers. You may have seen pictures of a, of a giant deer, with big antlers, because they're just prosperous. So the land was just bare, beautiful fawns. Verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by a well or a spring whose branches run over, over climbed the wall. This illustrates a healthy grapevine, which indicates prosperity and denotes the extraordinary increase of that tribe. The Eastern text reads, Joseph is a disciplined son or a cultured man. Joseph had been trained to be the chief of the tribe and successor to his father, Jacob. Verse 23, the archers have sorely grieved. They bitterly attacked him and shot at him and hated him. That's early in his life, right? His sons, I mean, his, his brothers. But his bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast and of the womb. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors or my parents, unto the utmost bounties of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. So Joseph is attacked by envy, revenge, temptation, ingratitude, but by the grace of God, he will triumph over all opposition because the sustainer of life, and he's, you know, becoming the sustainer of life for all of Israel. And then we get to Benjamin. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf, or he's as rav he is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he shall devour the prey, and at night, he shall divide the spoil. This tribe will be as fierce as a wolf against their enemies and would be victorious. Verse 28. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is, and this is it that their father spake unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. And he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron, the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Mechpah, Mechpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron, the Hittite, for a possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. He stretched out his feet on his bed is an Eastern idiom meaning he died. In the East, when a sick man is near death, they would stretch out his feet before he, before he is dead. And this is an illustration of that. Chapter 50, and Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. On Joseph, as the principal member of the family, came the duty of closing the eyes of his deceased father and of providing the farewell kiss. Verse 2, and Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. And 40 days were fulfilled for him, for so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him threescore and ten days. And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, Embalming would take 40 days. Then there would be a, a period of mourning for another 30 days out of respect and as a token of Egypt's affection and esteem for Joseph. His death was made a period of public mourning. You know, all the flags went to half staff and things like that. So for 70 days, the 40, while the embalming was going on and the 30 days of wailing was going on, the public mourning as the death of a royal dignitary would have been taking place. So it was a, you know, a public mourning. Everybody in the nation was in mourning. Verse 5. 
My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die. In my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there shalt thou bury me. Now, therefore, let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury thy father, according as he made thee swear. And Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, and all the house of Joseph, and his brethren, and his father's house, only their little ones, and their flocks, and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. It was a journey of about 300 miles. Joseph was escorted with an armed contingent of war chariots and horsemen to ensure their safety and, and rapid progress along the way. The funeral cavalcade, composed of the nobility and military with their equipages, would present a great and imposing appearance. Verse 10, and they came to the threshing floor of Atad. That type means the plain of the thorn bush. It's on the border of Egypt and Canaan, which is beyond Jordan. And there they mourn with a great and very sore lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father for seven days. The Egyptians did not want to enter Canaan. You can imagine what a huge force like that would look like to the Canaanites, to the people there. So they stopped at the border and lamented and carried out great and grievous rites or customs of mourning for seven days. It was of such intensity, though, that the local Canaanites gave it a name that meant intense mourning of lamentation. It was so intense for seven days. So they waited. Joseph continued. Verse 11. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Wherefore, the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, mourning or lamentation, which is beyond Jordan. And his sons did unto him according as he commanded them. For his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Mechpelah, which Abraham bought with the field for a possession of a burying place of Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. Still feeling guilt over what they had done to Joseph, fear of him now being able to take revenge since their father was dead, motivated his brothers to plead for their lives. Joseph was deeply affected by this, and because of his pious nature, he gave them strong assurances of his forgiveness. Verse 15, and when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph, will prevent you hate us, and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, you know, they made this up. Oh, <laughs> no. Dad said, leave us alone. You know? The father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and thy sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brother and also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Or he's saying, I am a servant of God. I'm in no way am I divine. I'm not the divine one. Don't fall down in front of me. What Joseph meant, was that he also was a human being under the care and guidance of God. His brothers were so frightened that they prostrated themselves before him as if they were worshiping God, saying, I'm not God, I'm just a man. Verse 20, but as for you, you thought evil against me, and you carried out your evil. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now, therefore, fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones, and be comforted them. And he spake kindly unto them. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children also of Machir, 
the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. Joseph would read books to him, I guess, on his knees, you know. And I love Proverbs 17, 6, because it fits with me today. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged. That's from the English Standard Version. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged, and the glory of children are their fathers. So Joseph lives 80 years after his elevation as Pharaoh's chief advisor. He witnessed a great increase in the prosperity of Egypt and also of his own family and kindred because God cares. Genesis 50, verse 24. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Hebrews 11.22, by believing Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel, and gave commandment concerning his bones. Moses made sure to collect and carry out Joseph's bones when they leave for the promised land. Exodus 13, 19, and Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn to the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones away hence with you. Now, Joseph's funeral would be conducted in the highest style of Egyptian magnificence, and his mummified corpse carefully preserved until the Exodus. The book of Genesis begins with God and ends with man. It begins with the creation of the heavens, the heavens above and ends with a coffin in Egypt. And then Exodus 1.8, now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. This new king will present life-threatening problems, which will lead to the children of Israel leaving for the land of promise. God will still care for his people throughout that journey. 